Imagine that we had a 6x12 chessboard. On one corner, we have a white rook. On the opposite corner, we have a black bishop. We are going to play a game where we take turns moving the rook. The goal of the game is to be the person to capture the bishop. But there are a couple of important rules. First, the white rook can only go up or right. In other words, on any given turn, the active player must make progress toward the bishop, and there is no passing of the turn. Second, the black bishop stays stationary, with one exception. It will move to capture the rook if the rook is available to capture. And if the bishop captures the rook, the previous player loses the game. Here's the puzzle. You go first. After that, we will alternate turns. Design a strategy that guarantees you the victory. And while you think about that, check out some of these cool books that I've written. Your hint for today is to apply backward induction, a topic I cover in Chapter 2 of Game Theory 101, The Complete Textbook. Think about what the good moves are at the end of the game, and use that information to work out what are good moves earlier in the game. As an additional hint, this is actually Welter's Game in Disguise, a topic we've covered previously in this series. Are you ready for the solution? If not, here's an additional hint. Your opening move must place the rook onto f1. Are you ready now? Then let's get to it. The first step in solving this game is realizing that you can't place the rook anywhere on the diagonal leading from the bishop. If you do that, the bishop captures the rook, and you immediately lose. Beyond that, you cannot place the rook on your turn anywhere on the row leading to the bishop or the column leading to the bishop. Now you indirectly lose because your opponent would be able to capture the bishop on the following move. Given that, do you see any squares that are safe to land on? Well, there are two, j5 and k4. If you land on either of those squares, all the legal moves your opponent has on the following turn are guaranteed to lose your opponent the game, and thereby allow you to win. Thus, this game is actually a race to landing on one of those squares. This is useful because it tells you that there are other squares that you cannot land on. Focus on just j5 for a moment. If you were to land anywhere else in row 5, you would end up losing. That's because your opponent can move to j5 on the subsequent turn and force a win from there. Likewise, Everywhere else in column J is a no-go zone. And it's for the same reason. If you land there, your opponent can move to J5 on the next turn and force a win after that. Meanwhile, K4 allows us to cancel out more squares. Everywhere else in row 4 is a bad idea, and same thing with column K. You place the rook anywhere there, your opponent moves to k4, and that still forces the victory. With all that, do you see any new squares that are now safe to land on? Think about h3 and i2. Every move your opponent has available from those squares are ultimately losing options. Every single one of those squares is painted red. 
As a result, if you land on h3 or i2, you will win. And in turn, this game is very much a race to one of those two squares. Realizing that allows us to cancel further squares. Thinking about h3, the row leading to it, as well as the column leading to it, are no-go zones. And it's the same thing for anything heading toward I2. If you place the rook in that row 2 or on I1, you're going to leave your opponent the availability to move the rook to I2 and ultimately win the game. And that takes us to our solution. Take a look at F1. Every move available from there is painted red. So that forces your opponent into a no-win situation, which is great for you. And that should be your opening move of the game. Further notice that b1, c1, d1, and e1 would all be losing moves, because if you were to open with the rook on one of those squares, your opponent could move to f1 instead. You can also see a clear pattern that's forming with these pairs of blue squares that are diagonal from one another. And in fact, if this board were larger, g0 would also be blue, and it would keep going down diagonally in that same sort of pattern. As a final note, you'll recall that I told you that this was Welter's game in disguise. Let's briefly talk about why that's the case. Recall that Welter's game requires moving these coins all the way to the right side of this line. What the coins represent in the chess game is movement on the rank for one of them and the file for the other. Once one of those coins reaches the end, that's equivalent in the chessboard problem as getting to the top of the rows or the rightmost of the columns. Moreover, in Welter's game, you're not allowed to have the coins occupy the same square. The chessboard equivalent is to be an equal number of rows and columns away from the top right square. Well, that's where the bishop comes in. If you're an equal number of rows and columns away from the top right corner, the bishop will come and capture you. And that's like having a rule where you can't be overlapping on the same square within Welter's game. Did you find the solution to this one? Let me know in the comments. And if you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and subscribe. And I'll see you next time. Take care.